Welcome to Chautauqua People. My guest today is Sam Stahl. He is a native of Sharon, Pennsylvania, a product of the University of Pittsburgh where he did his undergraduate work and Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati. He served for two years as an army chaplain with overseas duty in Korea. Sam has been awarded three doctorates, one earned and two honorary, the second honorary from the Oblate School of Theology, a Catholic institution. He served two congregations in Texas, retiring as Rabbi Emeritus from Temple Beth El in San Antonio, Texas, after 26 years of service. He's currently an associate in the Department of Religion at Chautauqua Institution. Sam, how did you make your way to Chautauqua? Well, I came here for the first time in 1998 when I was invited to be the lecturer at 2 o'clock for the, what they called then the religion lectures, now they're interfaith lectures. And I was paired with Dr. Norman Beck, a professor of theology and philosophy at Texas Lutheran University. And we did a five-day program, uh, Monday through Friday, on the topic, Bridges and Barriers to a Christian Jewish Understanding. Now, let's go a little further, Sam. A Chautauqua Institution was founded as a Methodist, as a Methodist institution made by a Methodist bishop and an industrialist in the 19th century with a very strong Protestant focus. Could you, in some detail, tell us about the establishment of a Jewish community here at Chautauqua? Well, the first Jewish official presence uh, was in 1960 when the Hebrew congregation was founded. And that congregation now is flourishing. The congregation uh, probably draws about 250 to 300 people every Friday night for Sabbath services at Chautauqua Lake near the Bell Tower. And on Saturday morning, maybe uh, 70 to 80 at the Hoover Church, which the church has been so, the church has been very, very gracious to us and has been uh, very willing to share its space with us. And, and um, how do we determine whether or not someone is Jewish? That's a very difficult question. Uh, there's a- in, in two hours or less. Yes, yes. There's a Jewish legal rule that says that anybody born of a Jewish mother uh, is Jewish automatically. Uh, a person who's born of a Jewish father and an, a mother who's not Jewish is technically not Jewish according to Jewish law. Now the reform, the liberal reform and the liberal reconstructionist movements, uh, they accept a child of a Jewish father and a mother who's not Jewish as Jewish if that child's been raised as a Jew through some formal act, uh, a baby naming, a, uh, a consecration, a confirmation, a bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah, whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's it. Now here's another tough one for you. Lots, lot, not tough, but we need, need lots of good information, particularly for many who are, have no Jewish friends. And those from old Chautauqua families such as myself came up recognizing three different types of Judaism, Orthodox, Conservative, and Reform, with many contemporary sources, and you just use the term yourself, identifying a fourth, a Reconstructionist. Can you help me to understand the differences in the beliefs and practices of these? Okay. Um, it all depends on how one views the uh, binding nature of Jewish law. The Orthodox, representing the very traditional, believes that the law was given by God and therefore every rule is binding, it's mandatory. The conservative Jews uh, have a theology that, that's liberal, but in terms of practice, it's almost orthodox with some adjustments. Uh, the conservative movement believes that the law is binding even though it may not be divinely revealed it may be divinely inspired, but the contention of the conservative rabbinate is that the way of Jewish life is to be abiding by, be law abiding, to live by what we call halakha. Mm -hmm. In practice, the Orthodox synagogue uh, is characterized by a, generally an all Hebrew service where men and women sit apart and there's no instrumental music. Uh, the Sabbath morning service on Saturday uh, lasts uh, from two and a half to three hours. The conservative service on Saturday morning is almost the same, has almost the same liturgy, 
The difference is that men and women uh, sit together. There's occasionally inter, uh, instrumental music, and women have full rights. Uh, there are women rabbis, women cantors, etc. in the conservative movement. Reconstructionism was not intended to be a movement. It was the creation of a, uh, a great Jewish thinker in the 20th century whose name was Mordecai Kaplan, Rabbi Mordecai Kaplan, and he was uh, a member of the faculty of the Jewish Theological Seminary, Conservative Seminary, but uh, he created his own school of thought called Reconstructionism, and he wanted Reconstructionism to influence the other three existing movements that you mentioned, Reform, which is the most liberal, conservative, and orthodox. Uh, at that time, Reform didn't embrace much of the ethnic and the cultural elements of Judaism. He wanted them to do that. Uh, the conservative was supposedly adjusting to modern circumstances, but they weren't adjusting fast enough. And similarly, it was, it was the case was the orthodox. He never wanted to become an in, independent movement. But about the late 60s, a group of his disciples, and by that time Rabbi Kaplan must have been 98, 99, whatever, uh, over his protest generally, they, they, uh, they formed an institution and uh, a denomination. They started the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College in Philadelphia that had some tie with Temple University, et cetera. And it's a small movement and it's not well known. And in terms of theology, it's very much like reform. In terms of practice, it's somewhere in between reform and conservative. Interesting, interesting. I had um, a good friend who, from military time, was the spouse of a fellow second lieutenant. And we've all done things along the way. And probably 15 years ago, she entered the reform seminary, now a rabbi, served for 10 years in California. And now, now is uh, retired and living in Asheville, North Carolina. Oh, okay. And so, so it's interesting to see how these come along. Yeah. And I haven't had the time to sit down opportunities recently to Nashville. I live in North Carolina during the year, and haven't had the time to sit down and say, "Now, Patty, let's let's get every last little detail out here, so that I have, well, so that I can talk to my students about it." And in it's some, an interesting evolution. Uh, we had a speaker last week at the Everett Jewish Life Center who addressed the issue of the development of women rabbis, the whole evolution of women rabbis. It was a Rabbi Laura Geller, who's the Rabbi Emeritus of Temple Emmanuel in Beverly Hills, California. She was the first rabbi, first female rabbi, to head a major congregation in the United States. Mm -hmm. and, uh, she was one of the, I think she was the third rabbi to be ordained the first third female rabbi to be ordained in the reform movement. So the first was in 72. Uh, theoretically, uh, the, uh, the movement's been open to women rabbis. In fact, there was a proposal sometime in the 20s at my seminary to ordain women rabbis, and uh, the Board of Governors at that time decided that even though in principle there's no problem with it, our American congregations would not be ready for a woman rabbi. So uh, the first, as I say, the first woman rabbi was a student of mine when I was, I was a senior at the graduate level at the Hebrew New College. And this uh, woman who's now the first woman rabbi, Rabbi Sally Prezad, she was in the undergraduate department and I taught a course in rabbinic Hebrew and she was one of my seven students. Goodness, do you keep in touch? My best student. I, I, I don't really, no. Okay. Now, um, can you go one step further and tell me about the practice of Judaism in the country today? What, what percentage of Jewish folks are practicing? And maybe a breakout by percentage we've identified these, these categories. Well, <clears throat> unfortunately, the number of American Jews who affiliate formally with a synagogue is dropping, uh, seriously. But in terms of affiliated Jews, I would say that 40% of the affiliated Jews are reform. 30% uh, are conservative, 10% uh, are orthodox, and the rest are other. Mm -hmm. uh, humanist, uh, reconstructionist, whatever. Uh, the, uh, so that, that it, 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 very interesting that right after World War II, the figures were flipped. 
where the conservative was the largest denomination and the reform was the second largest. Mm -hmm. And I attribute that to the fact that in 1982, 83, something like that, uh, we, uh, uh, no, it was in 78, actually. Rabbi Alexander Schindler was the head of the a congregational body known as the Union of American Hebrew Congregations declared that we're now going to be an outreach movement, especially to the interfaith families. Mm -hmm. And the conservative movement was kind of rejecting of interfaith families. So I think that many people who would normally at that time join a conservative congregation, they didn't feel welcome there, so they joined reform. And I think that's why reform is now constituting 40% of American Jewish affiliated Jews and uh, the conservative 30 percent. The conservative movement, by the way, in recent years has opened its doors to interfaith families. And so, so they've changed too. Yeah, yeah. My the whole the whole American Jewish culture is open to interfaith families, which was not the case uh, when I started my uh, career in 1967. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, that's it was considered somebody who intermarried was really considered somebody who wants to leave Judaism. It was a person who was almost betraying the traditions. But today, it's somebody who falls in love with somebody who's not Jewish, and that person can be very committed to Judaism. It can raise a Jewish family, and we welcome them warmly, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was a mistake at that time that we were so harsh on people and very judgmental of people who intermarried. And, and there's a matter now of keeping up with the times, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. No, my perception is the Orthodox population. Now, the Orthodox is an interesting yeah. uh, or interesting point. They are growing. Really? And they're, they're growing rapidly, uh, mainly because their families, unlike the conservative reform reconstructionists, uh, their families uh, consist of maybe eight, ten children, where the reform conservative, maybe they have no children, one child, two children, three children, you know. They don't have the large families. And their retention rate is much better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's an appeal for that kind of religion among everybody. You know, where there is no gray; it's black or white; it's yes or no; it's right or wrong. People like that authority structure. Also, to to be honest, the Orthodox provide a better and warmer community for people. Uh, if I were an Orthodox Jew, I could go anywhere in the world on a Friday night or Saturday morning, the Sabbath, go to a synagogue and be invited to dinner at somebody's home. Uh, so that they're, they're very welcoming, very uh, very embracing of uh, people, you know, who are observant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's significant. Now, um, let's switch gears a little bit and we'll come back and talk about these numbers in time. Um, Edith Everett then has come to this table several years ago and she uh, uh, talked about the history and development of the uh, Everett Jewish Life Center with uh, our viewers. This afternoon I went to an excellent lecture there about the current status of North Korea given by a gentleman with extensive government service and who's now a senior fellow at Brookings. That doesn't sound very Jewish. And I wonder if you could tell me what sorts of uh, activities does the Jewish community sponsor at Chautauqua? Well, we have three Jewish institutions. We have the Hebrew Congregation, founded in 1960. Mm -hmm. The Everett Jewish Life Center, I think, is 11 years old. And then we have a, a separate denomination according to the standards of the Department of Religion. We have Jewish, that includes the Hebrew Congregation, the Everett Center. Mm -hmm. And then we have Chabad Lubavitch. And they're, they're considered a separate denomination. This is a Jewish outreach group uh, ultra-Orthodox, but uh, embracing of everybody, and their goal is to make Jews more Jewish. They're not, into, uh, they're, uh, in quotations, evangelistic, only to Jews, though. They're not interested in, in converting the world. They, they, and their, their goals are modest. They want Jews to take on more observance, and if they take on one mitzvah, as they say, uh, such as lighting candles on Friday night to inaugurate the Sabbath, uh, they're happy with that. So uh, their, their institutions are not called synagogues because there's no board of directors or board of trustees to whom the rabbi is responsible. The rabbi is assigned to the, wherever 
he goes, and it's always a he, uh, by somebody in New York, in, Bro in Brooklyn. Uh, and the, they may have an advisory board or something, but, but the authority does not come from the board. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you indicated that the Friday night service is close to the bell tower down there at the lake. Was there any reconstruction of constructing a building such as a, uh, a synagogue on the grounds of Chicago? No, 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 no. We have no building whatsoever. Mm -hmm. We've had a wonderful arrangement with the Holbert Church from the beginning, and uh, we've not found any need to have a building. And it's an all-volunteer congregation. I must say, the, I mean, the leadership uh, there is probably better than most professional staffs of synagogues I've seen around the country. I mean, they're very dedicated, very efficient, very welcoming, and they're, they're fabulous people. And I'm glad to be associated with them. In fact, the president of the Hebrew congregation here was the president of my congregation uh, 30 years ago in San Antonio. Really? And he is an excellent, Larry Cohen, Dr. Larry Cohen. And so that, that makes good sense, doesn't yeah. it? Who brought who up here? Did you bring him or did he bring you up? Well, here? he came. I'm teasing. He came independently of me, okay. but I twisted his arm to work with the Hebrew congregation. Great. And a lot of other people twisted. He's been an exceptional president. Great. Is he retired now? Or? Yes, he's a retired surgeon. Good. Uh, he had to retire because of some disability mm -hmm. uh, several years ago, and uh, he has uh, served the congregation very, very nobly. Great. Great. Let's switch gears a little bit. And you indicated when we talked that you are an associate in the Department of Religion. Yes. Okay, tell me about those duties and how that fits. Well, it's really an unstructured uh, job description. Uh, one of my duties is to conduct the weekly discussion of the chaplains of the denominational houses. Every week there's a different chaplain, and we meet every Monday uh, at lunchtime at the Presbyterian House. And we go around the room, and everybody is supposed to identify himself or herself uh, by name, denomination, uh, uh, institution or congregation uh, he or she is serving, and the greatest challenge that he or she finds in the ministry, in his or her ministry. And uh, that, that gets the discussion moving. And, uh, we just had one this afternoon, actually. Great. Would you use the term ministry to describe a, a rabbi and a uh, We do in a general sense. We usually talk about a rabbinate. Rabbinate. It's a, it's a word I think the rabbis created for themselves, R-A-B-B-I-N-A-T-E. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's in the dictionary, but we talk about the rabbinate. Years and years ago, we talked about the Jewish ministry, but we don't anymore. In fact, in some communities, there was a board of Jewish ministers mm -hmm. instead of rabbis. Mm -hmm. now, now, in England, interesting, it's an interesting fact. In England, there's a, uh, there are two categories of Jewish clergy. There's the minister and the rabbi. Really? The rabbi has a much deeper education in Jewish law, and the minister does not have uh, that extensive an education. Uh, so they make that distinction in England, but not in America. Now, would the... the uh minister then be qualified to perform ceremonies such yes, as weddings yes. and any Jew could perform any ceremony really yes the, we don't have a priesthood a rabbi is not technically a clergy person okay a rabbi is a, a Jew with an education greater than that of the average layman isn't that interesting yeah it's we're not priests in that sense okay so there's no no thing that would say ordained or not ordained in the line we're ordained but uh, in, uh, the, in America, in many Western European countries, the rabbi's role is based on the role of a Protestant minister. Really? Uh, for example, there's no law that says a rabbi's main duty is to visit, uh, to be a pastor, to visit the sick, to, uh, to uh, comfort the bereaved, and so on. That's an obligation of every Jew. It's not a uniquely rabbinical role. Mm -hmm. But uh, because of American culture, it's, be, it, it's, been, it's been incumbent upon the rabbi to do these things that, in, in the name of the congregation. But mm -hmm. the, that's not a traditional rabbinical role. The rabbi is supposed to be a teacher, a scholar, a judge, you know, a judge of rabbinical law, but not, not, a, not a pulpit rabbi in the sense that we have it today. 
That's that's the pulpit rabbi is like a pulpit Protestant minister. That, that's what it is. Not in content, but in form. Yeah, I never knew that. That's yeah. we're learning some good things yeah. tonight. Yeah. Now, um, do you see greater um, integration of the Jewish community at Chautauqua? Oh, uh, uh, there's been a sea change in the last fifty years. As you know, John, uh, you're family was the first family to sell a home to a Jewish person in 1965 when Ken Frayden bought a home. Indeed. Until that time, Jews came to Chautauqua for programs, but they nobody would sell a home to the, a Jewish person. I don't think it was an institution-wide policy, but there were deed restrictions that homeowners had. Mm -hmm. And uh, But over the years, there's been a broadening of, uh, of interest in Judaism, uh, and I attribute a lot of it to the heads of the Department of Religion, starting with uh, Ralph Lowe, continuing with Ross McKenzie, then Joan Brown Campbell, uh, Robert Franklin, and now Bishop Gene Robinson. Bishop Gene Robinson, I mean, this would have been unheard of uh, even 20 years ago, where the first week in Chautauqua this year, for as the chaplain of the week for the Protestant service, there was a rabbi. Rabbi Sharon Browse, first time ever. That would have been unheard of even five years ago, maybe. I had a very interesting experience within the hour where I picked you up to come here, and I'm out walking dogs, and, and a Protestant theologian who sat at this table, and I just stopped and I said, I'm doing an interview tonight. Oh, who? I said, Sam Stahl. And he replied that probably the best sermon he's heard this year came from our week one chaplain on Sunday. And I thought to myself, isn't that significant? And this is, this is a man who is a absolute wonderful judge of what is a, what is a, a first-rate performance. Yeah, oh, she was stunning. She was absolutely stunning at her presentation, her content, uh, really is a, a great beginning, mm -hmm. a great beginning. And now we have uh, what we call the Abrahamic Initiative, we have a program called APIA, Abrahamic Program for Young Adults. We have two Muslims, a Christian and a Jew. Now, unfortunately, this year and last year, we haven't been able to find some a Jewish young person to fill that role. So I've been filling it at almost 80 years old. Uh, so we have what we call tabling every Thursday at uh, noon. We sit in front of the post office and there's a, a sign that says, ask a question of a Jew, Christian, or Muslim. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're, we're there to present. And last uh, a week ago, Sunday, we had an interfaith service, which is an annual event for the Sacred Song on Sunday night. And uh, I filled the role of the Jewish Appia. Got it. Because the Appia uh, young people are the ones that present the service with Bishop Robinson. Got it. Wonderful. Now, this is a question I like to ask everybody who's here and, and shape it to, to your background. Let's say you're at a Friday night service down there by the lake, and after the service is through and there's good fellowship among those in attendance, a young Chautauquan comes up to you and expresses an interest in going into rabbinical service and asked if we could sit and talk over coffee so it's not just a quick mm -hmm. item. What would your advice be? Um, I would be very happy. I would have to talk to that person and find out the reasons that he or she would want to enter the rabbinate, uh, what, what the motivations are. We're not called in the same sense that a Christian clergy person is called. Mm -hmm. uh, it has to be a need to serve the Jewish people, uh, to serve the human community, uh, to to study, to learn, to uh, to minister, you know, I would have to to explore those issues. And congregational life can be challenging, as you know. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're, we're dealing with live human beings, and uh, every congregation has its power structure and has its. Uh, the political aspects, uh, so to speak. I, I, I hate to use that word to describe a religious institution, but you know, there are power politics that are played at every institution. Mm -hmm. And the, the rabbi has to know how to navigate that 
without mm -hmm. losing his soul or her soul. Mm -hmm. And how would you sort out suggesting a, one of these four directions that we've we've gone? Uh, how would I sort out? Uh, so what, what, the person should be orthodox or reform or reconstructionist? Well, um, first of all, I think I would have to find out what the person's background is. Right. Some of them have no background at all in Hebrew or we have to have a very extensive Hebrew background to become rabbis. Okay. So I have to find out that. Find out how the person was raised, uh, how the person now identifies. Some of these people have no idea what the movements all stand for. You know, they were raised maybe in a conservative synagogue. They haven't been back to a synagogue since their bar bat mitzvah. And uh, they're not familiar with the current scene, so I'd have to acquaint them with, uh, with, with what, what the realities are today. Mm -hmm. So I, I, you know, and I would try to find out what their, as I say, the motivations are, are very important. And I want to make sure they're going to making a decision that's emotionally healthy, you know, not something that's filling a need for uh, acceptance or uh, validation or whatever. So that it's, it's a really a, a healthy need that's driving them to become a rabbi. Right. Now that's a, that's a critical issue though, isn't it? Yeah. Advising young folks. Yeah. One last open-ended question, Sam. I'm going to throw it back at you. We have just over a minute left from our allocated 28 minutes. And I always like to give our speaker a chance to add some things that may have been overlooked that are essential. Well, I am thrilled with the uh, evolution of Jewish acceptance at Chautauqua. I would say at any one time during the season, there are 25 to 30 percent of the population which is Jewish. Uh, and we now, with the Everett Jewish Life Center, can take our place proudly. We're no longer guests here, we're hosts. And that's an important distinction. We're, we're part of Chautauqua. We always felt kind of like a minority, second class, you know, not quite, quite, quite there, not quite, quite Chautauquan. Now we're fully Chautauquan. And I hope that, uh, you know, we're accepted. I'm sure there are elements that we wish we would go back to the way it was in the 50s, but that's always going to be the case. That's a growing minority from what I understand. I mean, I should say a shrinking minority, the shrinking minority. Much. We've been very well accepted, uh, and uh, I, uh, I'm very thrilled with that direction. And indeed, I've been good citizens, I thought, about that program today. Yeah. yeah. And large numbers of people there were not Jewish, like myself. Yeah. And I had five years on the Korean Peninsula as an intelligence officer, so I, I had to go see the program. There's no debate. Yeah. yeah. Sam, we are out of time, and this has been great fun. It's been wonderful, I, John. I hope you'll come back. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so very wonderful. much.